This is the Paying It Forward Podcast, Episode 4. And I think the other thing that I really see is, particularly with the um, generation that's just coming into their own career, the folks that are willing to take a job to get into an organization that they want to be a part of and prove themselves, those are the folks that get into the organization first, promote very rapidly, and succeed. Hi, and welcome to the Paying It Forward podcast. My name is Steve Richards. Thank you for listening. I believe if you want to attain a C-level position in your career, you need to understand what it takes to achieve that level of leadership. When you have access to successful entrepreneurs and senior executives who want to help you develop the skills and traits to become a great leader, it's like having your own mastermind group to mentor and guide you. In a nutshell, that's our podcast. In just a few moments, we'll sit down with Heather Moyer in part two of our two-part interview. Heather will touch on A players, recruiting A players, and what you can do to stand out and become an A player. We will also discuss specific things that you can focus on, such as educating yourself and taking advantage of the tools that are out there, how the book The One Thing impacted Heather along her path. We'll talk about what the most important relationship is that you should have, how a can-do and will-do attitude will impact your future greatly. And finally, we'll touch on servant leadership, communication, healthy conflict, and conflict resolution. Since this is part two, let's pick up the interview where we left off. Hi, Heather. Welcome back. I appreciate your time again. Thanks for having me. Is it difficult hiring these days? I think actively recruiting A players has and will continue to always be difficult. Mm. So I think the performers, the people that perform at the top 10%, those people are generally always employed or working on something. They are hard to engage. They're selective and they're very well networked. So oftentimes they don't need a whole lot of help in finding their next opportunity. Now, all that to be said, you know, everybody at one point in their career is looking for an opportunity. So I think there's a lot of hustle that goes into attracting A players, maintaining relationships and what I call candidate pipelining and really developing those relationships to your earlier point with potential A players and then making sure that you have that good alignment and core value and skill set. So how do I stand out? So what do I need to do to be one of those 10%? So I think creativity is what I've seen be the most successful recently. Um, Not necessarily just throwing your resume out to 100 different positions at one time, but really finding a company that is a fit for you and relentlessly pursuing that opportunity. Getting your resume in front of the right person, calling in, dropping off, snail mailing, you know, really being professionally assertive, being creative in your approach to uh, getting reviewed. And I think the other thing that I really see is, particularly with the um, generation that's just coming into their own career, the folks that are willing to take a job to get into an organization that they want to be a part of and prove themselves, those are the folks that get into the organization first, promote very rapidly, and succeed. Mm. So be willing to do what it takes. And it might not be that out of college, you're going to get a director level title (laughs) at 90K. It might not be that. So a very pointed question. What specific things, you've sort of elaborated on most of them or some of them, but I'm really curious if there are any additional specific things that you think either the younger generation or the next generation of workforce really needs to focus on in advancing their career. Like one or two, three key points where... If you guys just do this, it, it'll be fine, but don't do not do this or whatever it may be. I would say know yourself, what you're looking for in your career, how you can contribute both to the organization and to society, and to society as a whole, and educate yourself. Mm. There are so many tools that are available to incoming workers that have not been available to generations past. True. There are incredible podcasts where you get where you get access to C-suite executives from around the world. There are books, there are blogs, there are seminars, 
there's online learning. LinkedIn has a great online yeah, learning great. platform, which during COVID has been free. Even better. What a beautiful gift. What a beautiful gift. Take a training. Commit to doing something. I read this great book called The One Thing, and it has the simplest, most impactful framework, which is whatever your end goal is. So let's say Heather wants to buy a house by the time she's 30. The one thing really gets you to focus on what's the one thing you have to do today, this week, and this month, and then this year to get you to that goal at 30. So what is the one thing that you can do today to get yourself hired where you want to be? In previous generations, it seemed that there was a certain way you just went about getting a job, progressing through your career, got the watch at the end, life was great. But then there's the traditional, I'm an employee or I'm a business owner. When you describe ownership, accountability, researching, studying, learning, progressing, being true to yourself, teaching yourself, learning, training, all that stuff. Great stuff. They find a job. They get in that job and then people just kind of drift down the river. I think the smart ones, the yeah. smart ones are really working ahead of themselves. They're looking out and mm -hmm. saying, I can get that ring. I can go after that brass. I can get there. You know, Steve, I, I'll say though, and I, I'm going to challenge you on that and not in a way that I don't agree with you. I do agree mm -hmm. with you. But my challenge is I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to shift away from the understanding and belief that we have to train people and really embrace that we need to develop mm -hmm. people. We are in a situation where we have an influx of new employees and talent that are a certain way. And we're not going to be able to influence that at this point. The only thing that we can do as leaders is develop our managers to learn how to work with this generation and to inspire and require them to develop their skills. Society is so interesting and so different even than it was when I was growing up. There's a lot of pressure on young people. Social media is very neat in some ways and I think very damaging in other ways in the comparison standpoint. And what I see in the incoming workforce is, is that there is a real lack of self-worth and confidence in their own ability truly right so i'm not talking about about ego and fake confidence and the the parts of people that show up um, to get the job done but the real true self-worth and confidence i think is lacking and i think in so many ways that's because of what's happening in our society and as managers i think we have a real opportunity and gift to learn how to develop this generation into being whole, fully developed, wonderful contributors to the workforce. So how do you go about identifying or, or take just take that one step further? How do you go about identifying somebody to be that next leader? Like if I said, okay, there's a succession plan for your company, there may or may not be, but let's suppose you need to, you're going to develop that next set of leaders. How do you go about doing that? What, what, what are you identifying? Because I, li I like the, we should get out of the training aspect, we should get in the developmental aspect. I think that's huge. I, li I liked everything you said there a lot. Right. And I'm thinking, okay, if you're developing people, you're developing them, them for a result, either to be a better person, better worker, or even a leader. So how would you take what you just said and help others become the next leader? I think starting with the interview process for me, when I talk about alignment and having a fit and identifying whether or not someone has the capacity and aptitude for that initially is asking for examples of times in their lives where they've had conflict, struggle, or challenge, and they were able to self-reflect and move forward. So for me, I, I ask a lot of scenario-based questions around times in their lives where they've had to be an overcomer because for me, it's important for me to see that they can, they are resourceful, they can solve problems, um, and that they can succeed from that perspective. Once an individual is in your organization, you have the can do, will do question. Can you do it? And will you do it? And 
if you can do it but won't do it, is there a way that we can get you to identify what that is for you? And if not, then you're probably not going to be a good fit, mm. right? Mm. Um, so, but you may be a great fit somewhere else. So I, I think it's just, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I also um, hired a coach recently who's just really helped to develop me. And he uses the situational leadership model a lot, which is, you're very familiar oh, yeah, with. Yeah. It's interesting. I found I found over my career that servant leadership to me is a, a huge thing as a leader. Giving before taking, I think it's important. What's interesting is when you look at various situations and put people in them, people either sink or swim. Some flounder, some float. That's fine. Like you, I like people that will, if I interview well up front who I'm bringing in, the opportunity for success is even greater. I don't, I don't harbor this. I've got this person still here. I'm still paying them. I got to get room. You know, it's slow to hire, quick to fire kind of deal. I had a, a mentor actually ask me a question. I was having an employee conflict years ago. And he said, well, this is the question I always ask myself. He said, would you hire that person again? And if you did, would you put them in this position? Oh. And when you're having an employee conflict, by asking yourself honestly those two questions and answering them honestly, you in, in ways have your path forward. So let's talk conflict resolution. It comes up every day in almost every company somewhere along the way. I think about people who can cope or not cope. I'm not sure the generation coming out of college or the generation coming up in the workforce is all that really great at either identifying or dealing with conflict. How do you, how, any recommendations for how to handle conflict resolution in addition to what you just described? As a leader, I encourage my staff two things, transparency and embracing healthy conflict. Hmm. They hear me say this at least once a week. This is healthy conflict. Let's talk about it. I believe that there is such a thing as healthy conflict. And I think that's in a lot of ways where innovation happens in an organization. When you have differing opinions, you have the opportunity to see and look at things differently and use it as a platform to innovate. And so I really encourage my people to do that. I think why we've been successful is because when somebody comes in to me or to their manager, and talks about a conflict that they're having, it's a safe place. There's no judgment. There's a conflict. It's not about a person. If you think of like the hero, villain, victim triangle, mm -hmm. we don't focus on the person in the conflict. We focus on the actual conflict. So what's the conflict? How can we potentially solve it? And hey, at the end of this, wasn't this discussion great? Wasn't it healthy that we solved this problem and didn't make it about a person? That's been really impactful for us. So setting egos aside is important. Being able to say it's not so much my role or my title as it is the item we need to resolve. It seems like people just aren't really good at it. People aren't really good at doing exactly what you described, where they can see it for what it is, open and honestly talk about it, recognize we just have to figure out how to get over this or get rid of this, whatever it may be, and move forward. Well, and to be fair, Steve, I mean, I'm 17 years into a leadership position and I probably am just getting really good at it 17 years later. Wow. I would avoid conflict. You know, I would I would do my best to solve the problem without asking for help or, or needing a lot of input probably until the last several years when I got to the point where I just couldn't do it alone anymore, wow. right? Um, and, you know, one of probably my biggest regrets in my career was some moments where I could have picked up the phone and said, hey, there's a misunderstanding here. What you think is happening is not happening. You know, this is what's happening. How can we resolve wow. this? You know, I love, respect, want to work with you, whatever that conversation looks like. You know, those are some of my biggest regrets that I didn't have those conversations. And so I think it's an opportunity for me to teach my folks growing up professionally that that is very impactful and powerful. You've been 17 years into it as a leader running your own company. You had five or six years before that in your career. So you're, you're well into this, let's say, just round it up to 20 years. It might be a little less, might be a little more. But let's say over the last 20 years, if you could go back today, you could go back to your younger, the younger Heather, 
Is there any advice, single piece of advice, anything that you wish you'd have known then that you now know? My favorite piece of advice is that the most important relationship that you have is the one with yourself. Because? Really knowing who you are and what you want and what you give back to this world, that's where your power really Hmm. is. And it's not about you. It's about what you have to give. And so that is, that's the best advice I ever got from a holistic standpoint. From a professional standpoint, I would say in a transition, in a career transition for me, uh, one of my mentors said, Heather, it's a long life in a small world. And for whatever reason, that really resonated with me. And I, I've used that and remembered that moving forward. And I keep that in my decision matrix, right? So that's when I'm really, I'm really helpful. curious about that. Can you, can you elaborate more on how that, how that motivates you? Like how that stayed with you? Yeah. So, I mean, I think so often in moments, we want to make decisions, which is human nature, for our own best interest, right? And when I heard that it's a long life in a small world, what I heard was understand the impacts that your actions have, not only today, but for your life and throughout your career and the ripple that it will also have for all the other people that you impact. So for me, it was looking at things outside of myself and looking at the ways that we can impact others and make decisions that are good for the collective and not necessarily just good for yourself. What's the single most important quality you find being a leader? Your ability to listen. Ah, Great. That is the number one consistent answer I get. You have to be a good listener, which most people think most leaders don't listen at all. And the number one thing they're really good at is listening. As a worker along my career, I thought, oh, I got to hear a word I said. He heard every word, and they, and you have to be able to listen. Give me the second one after listening. What do you think is the next best thing? Most important quality, I should say. In my position, vision. Yep. And I would say a really close third is communication. Yeah. That would have been the next one because I would have asked you, and I would like to ask you, when you're listening, how hard is it to be a good listener? And then how hard is it to actually get others to communicate clearly? <laughs> not the not the chuckle I expected there, but I like it. <laughs> what I find for me personally is when I'm in a conversation and I'm thinking about how I'm going to respond, it's difficult to listen. Yeah. That's human nature. If I'm unattached from my own response, I find listening to be much easier. So what can people do to be better listeners? Aside from just listening, what can people really do to be, is this, is it active listening? Is it really reiterating what you've heard? I think it's, it's separation from the message that somebody else is trying to give you. So a lot of the things that I work on with my staff is not taking things personally. Mm. Sometimes when we're listening to somebody else, we're already thinking about how that maybe is impacting us or whether or not they're telling us this because it's a reflection of us. I think it's human nature to take things personally. And so that's something that we work on here within the organization. The other piece of really impactful advice I got a few years ago, I was frustrated. I was having a conflict with someone who had worked for me for a really long time. And I remember telling a friend of mine she's not hearing me. She's not hearing me. And I don't understand why she's not hearing me. And he said, well, Heather, as the deliverer of the message, you are responsible for making sure she hears what you were trying to tell her. And Steve, the light bulb went off. I thought, no, she's not listening. (laughs) And he was like, no, you're not communicating clearly. That was a gift. So I'm thinking about people who are poor communicators or lack of communicators or let's call it very quiet communicators. How can someone be a better communicator? (laughs) My head of people and I joke that um, by the time we've said something 17 times, people are starting to hear us. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, repeat uh, what you're saying, I think, is important as a leader. But as someone who's trying to develop their communication skills, I mean, some of the, the tools that I've used are our journals, sitting down, huh. writing out your thoughts and feelings, um, understanding the difference between facts and feelings, I think is really important. 
and getting some clarity around what it is you want to achieve by having a conversation and what would feel important for you to be heard around. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, and still in difficult conversations, I'll take notes for myself to make sure that I'm clear on what those two answers are for myself. Okay, so trick question. Fast forward your, your daughter and your son about to embark on their career. As a mom, you have a vested interest in their starting off strong. As a entrepreneur and a business owner, you certainly want them to be a good contributor. If I asked you for the one single most important piece of advice that you would give the two of them, what would it be as they're about to embark on their career? What's the one, two things they absolutely need to never, always do but never forget to do? Well, first is foundational, which is understand your personal why. What is it? that is important and impactful for you to make a difference in in this world. So that would be my goal for my children in their whole life is to understand their own personal why and to work to achieve that. Tactically, I will encourage them to invest in themselves in learning and development and taking risk. But is there anything else I didn't ask you? You know, I don't think there's anything else you haven't asked me, but I think the the message that I would like to send today is wherever you are listening to this podcast, you know, wherever you find yourself in your career or personally, if you are feeling stuck or frustrated or defeated, just know that you have everything you need within yourself to succeed and you got this. Awesome. Looking ahead, what's down the road for you that's got you excited? What are you working on? What do you see ahead of yourself? You go, ah, I just, I'm stoked for this. I'm really excited. Gosh, the business is in such a transformation right now. We have really started to develop these new service lines. It's so much more complex than it has ever been before, somewhat out of necessity and somewhat just out of innovation. I'm really excited as I move from managing an organization to really just managing a team of people that manage the organization, how that will develop each of them how that will improve and increase our footprint throughout the United States and ultimately get us to achieve our end goal, our North Star, which is to positively impact and improve the lives of 3 million people. Are there any causes or charities? I know you're involved in EO and YPO. Are there any causes or charities or foundations that would be very beneficial for our our listeners to know? Yeah. Well, I think philanthropy is so important and not necessarily just from a financial and monetary standpoint, but from a time standpoint, I think in serving, we often get so much more than we give. And that's just been a gift. Specifically, I sit on a couple different boards, um, Echo in the Valley, which is a a nonprofit that supports frontline workers and their families during COVID, mm-hmm. which I'm really passionate about as the wife of a firefighter paramedic. I also am part of Peers Network here in San Diego when we are supporting a lot of organizations that help first generation graduates of college and other organizations that provide uh, shelter, food, and supplies to homeless teenagers and young adults. Those are the those are the organizations right now that really have my heart. If a uh, if a listener wanted to reach out to you, what is the best way for them to reach out to you? Is it LinkedIn? Is there any other way they could reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So LinkedIn would be the best place to reach me. So Heather Moyer at H and M Systems. My email address is hmoyer at h and m systems dot com, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Heather. This has been fabulous. I'm so glad we got to connect. She is Heather Moyer, President, CEO, and Founder of H&M Systems. And as you just heard, Heather has quite a bit to say on how you can stand out and be an A player, particularly utilizing the can-do, will-do attitude, knowing the most important relationship you need to have, and how educating yourself with tools such as LinkedIn or the book, The One Thing, can help you grow and provide more value in your career. This information and more is in the show notes section of this episode on our website. Simply go to www.lessonsfromthecsuite.com forward slash episode four. 
You can follow our podcast for free on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, Libsyn, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast player. If you happen to think this is a five-star worthy podcast and you leave a written review, I'll be sure to mention your name in an upcoming episode as a small way to say thank you. If you're not yet following this podcast, please go to www.lessonsfromthecsuite.com, sign up or subscribe, it's free, and you'll receive a PDF on various ways you can pay it forward every day. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, any guest suggestions, or any feedback in general, please send us an email at feedback at lessonsfromthecsuite.com or go to our website and submit a message directly. Thank you for listening. Until next time.